Welcome to worship at Emmanuel Lutheran Church of Earlville on this fourth Sunday of Advent. Uh, we have a couple of announcements for you for this coming week. Uh, first, as you probably already heard, we are going to be celebrating Christmas Eve with a worship service on the lawn of the church, um, and it is predicted to be pretty cold on Thursday at 5 p.m. So um, don't forget to dress warmly. We expect this service to last no more than 15 or 20 minutes. We will have hand warmers available for those who need them. And uh, if you have any of those little battery powered lights, we've delivered some to people, but we also will have some on Thursday as well. So please bring those with you if you will. And then on Friday, on Christmas Day, we have a, a special surprise for our members of the congregation. So um, you'll want to tune into that on our Facebook page around 11 o'clock on, um, on Thursday. Next Sunday, a week from today, we will have our service of lessons and carols and that will come to you um, courtesy of two of our um, ELCA synods, our Northern Illinois Synod and the Metro Chicago Synod. So you will actually have a choice to make about um, which service you might want to watch um, on our Facebook page. Uh, the one from the Northern Illinois Synod is probably a bit more traditional the other from our Metro Chicago Synod, a little more contemporary and, um, and probably a little more diverse as well. You can watch either or both um, next Sunday. Uh, should be ready for you at about 11 a.m., if not before. So with that, we begin our worship today. And uh, we do that by lighting our fourth candle um, for this Advent season. We praise you, O oh God, for this wheel of time that marks our days of preparation for Christ's Advent. As we light the candles on this wreath, open our eyes to see your presence in the lowly ones of this earth. Enlighten us with your grace that we may sing of your Advent among us in the word made flesh. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. Amen. Please also join me in the prayer of the day for the fourth Sunday of Advent. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. With your abundant grace and might, free us from the sin that would obstruct your mercy, that willingly may bear your redeeming love. That Let's start this one again, Terry, wherever you are. Please join me in the prayer of the day. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. With your abundant grace and might, Free us from the sin that would obstruct your mercy, that willingly we may bear your redeeming love to all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We invite uh, Chris Fritz to come, over for, uh, to come up for the reading of our lessons.
The first reading for this fourth Sunday in Advent is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning with the first verse. We read, Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you want, wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, your throne. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Hear now the psalm reading from Luke 1. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For you, For Lord, you, Lord have, have looked, looked with, with favor, favor on, on your, your lowly servant. servant. From, From this day, all, all generations, generations will call me blessed. blessed. You, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. You have mercy on those, on those who, fear who fear you, you from, from generation, generation to generation. generation. You have shown strength with your arm and scattered the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things, and has sent the rich away empty. You, you have, have come, come to the, the aid of, of your servant Israel, Israel to remember the promise of mercy, mercy, the promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children forever. The second reading from Scripture is Romans chapter 16, beginning with the 25th verse. We read, now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the first chapter, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, 
to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. She was little more than a girl on the cusp of adolescence when the angel Gabriel came to her in a vision. He was an old man when Gabriel appeared to him during his duties as a temple priest from the order of Abijah. These two visions are the subject of the beginning of the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, which chronicles the birth stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. She, Mary, was newly engaged to Joseph, a devout man descended from the Davidic line of Israelite leaders. He, Zechariah, had been married to Elizabeth for many decades, and although they longed for a child, they had not been so blessed. They were past their childbearing years and believed that a child now was an impossibility, as did Abraham and Sarah many centuries before them. She, Mary, had not even begun to think about children yet. Being about 13 years old, the age of our junior high confirmation students here at Emmanuel. Mary was not ready for that responsibility, and she couldn't believe what Gabriel was telling her. And yet, both were told by Gabriel that they would become parents. Zechariah and Elizabeth would have a son, John the Baptist, who came to pave the way for the arrival of the Messiah. Mary's fiancé, Joseph, also had received an angelic message, according to Matthew's gospel. Even though he knew he was not the biological father of the baby Mary was carrying, he was told that he was still to take Mary as his wife and raise her baby with her. The baby was to be called Jesus, which means God has saved this child would grow up to be the savior of the world. Now I can almost hear Zechariah and Mary saying, wait, what? No way. Zechariah may have said, my wife is barren and has been for many years. Mary may have said, but I have not known any man yet. This is impossible. Both must have wondered, how can this be? And yet, the angel replied, 
Nothing is impossible with God. The promises are both to individuals and to communities, to Zechariah and Elizabeth, to Mary and Joseph, and to the people of Israel, even to the people of all nations. Now, if you were God and were going to send a savior into the world, wouldn't you pick a well-known place like Rome, the seat of the empire, or Jerusalem, the location of the holy temple, for Jesus' birthplace instead of a backwater town like Nazareth in Galilee? Nazareth was a town about one quarter the size of Earlville, Illinois. And wouldn't you choose for the mother of the Savior a royal, wealthy celebrity, perhaps the daughter of a high priest or the emperor? Well, God defies norms and expectations by identifying a temple priest of low socioeconomic rank and a poor, unworldly peasant girl to bear the Son of God and his cousin, John, into this world. Do not be afraid, Gabriel told both Zechariah and Mary. You have found favor with God, the angel tells the teenage mother. It's the same greeting Gabriel extends to the lowly shepherds in the fields who became some of the first to witness baby Jesus' birth. Good news, Gabriel says of all of this. God is working through all the confusion and disorder to bring his plan for the redemption of the world to fruition. That is the case even when the main characters and we can't discern what's going on at the time. Have you ever wondered what Gabriel would have said or done if Mary had refused to bear the Christ child? After all, not every young woman would be willing to take on the task that the angel described. One biblical scholar described the encounter between Gabriel and Mary in the following way. She, Mary, struck the angel Gabriel as hardly old enough to have a child at all, let alone this child. But he'd been entrusted with a message to give her, and he gave it. He told what the child was to be named and who he was to become, and he said something about the mystery that was going to come upon her. You mustn't be afraid, Mary, he said. As he said it, he only hoped she wouldn't notice that beneath his great golden wings, he himself was trembling with fear to think that the whole future of creation hung now on the answer of a girl. And this conversation was adapted from um, books called Peculiar Treasures and Beyond Words by the theologian Frederick Beekner. Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was conceived by means of the Holy Spirit, is often considered Luke's model of obedient, contemplative discipleship. She is not defined by her biological motherhood, but she is blessed and revered for her unhesitating belief, as are all who hear the word of God and obey it. For girls and women, issues around sexual activity and reproduction were huge in biological times, in biblical times as this gospel text suggests. Judgments were freely made about a woman's character based on her perceived involvement in sexual activity. So let's take a look at how this plays out in the chapter, the, the first chapter of Luke. The gospel writer juxtaposes Elizabeth and Mary, women of two different generations. For Mary, there may have been great shame in becoming pregnant 
before marriage. And I have to wonder how Mary explained her circumstances to her parents. I wondered if they believed her, and I wonder if they supported her. People in and around Nazareth certainly would have talked about this as Mary's pregnancy progressed and as assumptions would be made about her and her child born out of wed wedlock. Judgment might also be made about Joseph, but Mary would bear the brunt of the gossip. In the case of Elizabeth, the gossip, the gossip may have been just as strong. Why had she been cursed by God and unable to bear children for so long? Surely she must have done something wrong because to be childless in her society was an indication that God did not favor her. Her husband, Zechariah, had been struck unable to speak because he had dared to question the angel about how this late-in-life pregnancy came about. An old woman who had never been able to bear children suddenly pregnant? Preposterous. And I wonder if the situation today has changed all that much, especially for women who seem to bear the brunt of the negative reactions, guilt, or shame that might come along with an unexpected pregnancy on the flip side, or, or on the flip side, infertility. After all, to a certain extent, there are still raised eyebrows when word gets out that a high school girl is pregnant and intends to have the baby and raise it. If she aborts the pregnancy, even greater scrutiny can follow, perhaps with pro-life and pro-choice factions vocally uh, questioning her decision. Questions are also raised when a woman over a certain age, often married, has not had children. We start to wonder what's wrong there does she not want to have children, or can't she? And there are judgments and assumptions, and sometimes pity for these women and their partners. And here I dare to share some personal exper exper experiences that may speak to both situations. My sister, who lives in Arizona, found herself pregnant many years ago now. She considered all her options and decided to carry and give birth to the baby, unsure about whether she would place him for adoption or try to raise him on her own. Knowing that our mother, the baby's grandmother, would take this news very hard, I volunteered to tell her in person about this unplanned pregnancy so that my sister wouldn't have to break the news to her over the phone. My sister was not married at the time and did not plan to marry the father of her child. As expected, my mother dissolved into tears when I told her, and it took a while to calm her down. I believe she thought of her daughter's pregnancy as a failure of her own as a mother. In time, though, she adjusted to the news, and by the time my nephew came along, she fell in love with this little boy, her first grandchild, and they formed a close bond. Perhaps 10 years later, while my husband and I had our daughter and were trying to have a second child, we were faced with a secondary infertility situation. This is when a couple, having already had a child, is unable to conceive a second one. I was devastated, and it took me a long time to come to grips with the fact that I would not have another biological child. We tried several months of advanced infertility treatment which required me to drive to a Chicago area hospital several times a week. 
it also required a great deal of discernment about the use of advanced reproductive technology, or ART for short, to conceive a baby. We were concerned about how far to pursue advanced, these advanced methods, wondering how to figure out the dividing line between our wishes to have another child and what God's intentions for our family were. And I honestly would have to say that at that time, the church was not very helpful to us in thinking through the theological implications of our choice. We learned that very few pastors or priests, since there were one of each of us in, our, in this couple, we learned that pastors and priests did not have the background or skill to help a, a couple work through this type of decision. Around Thanksgiving of the year we were undergoing treatment, we learned that we were pregnant using advanced reproductive technology, and we began to plan for baby number two to arrive the next summer. And then, about a month later, we learned that the pregnancy was not viable. I miscarried on Christmas morning and did not have the heart to go through the, pro the process again. In retrospect, I now wish we'd seriously looked into domestic or international adoption as a way to grow our family. I share these scenarios today to shine a light on how greatly those situations impact the lives of women. Certainly they impact boys and men as well, but I believe the impact is much different for a woman because she is so bound up, body, mind, and spirit, in the event of having a child or not being able to have a child. There certainly can be a sense of failure for either person in a couple when our bodies don't do what we think and hope they're supposed to do. Unlike Zechariah's response to the angel Gabriel, which was a protest that he and Elizabeth could not bear a child at their adv advanced age, what was Gabriel thinking? But it, uh, in contrast to that response, Mary responds in a more measured way when she gets the news that Jesus is on the way. She is be described as being perplexed, and puzzled. Discipleship, as exemplified by Mary, requires obedience, even when we don't understand. And Mary is the perfect example of obedience, even when she did not understand. God encounters her through the angel Gabriel, breaking into her world, breaking into our world in a way that changes our lives forever. For you see, she considered what type of message this may be. She took assurance from the comforting words of the angel, the Lord is with you, do not be afraid. As the prophets of old, God, in these two announcements and birth stories, has revealed his, his purpose through a vision to an old man and to a young woman. This is the only time in the Bible in which an announcement of a s significant birth is made to a woman. In all other cases, the angel appears to a man. When Gabriel appears to Mary in Nazareth, a town so insignificant that is never mentioned in the Old Testament, it is because Jesus represents the most significant of all births. God exalts the poor and lowly in accomplishing his purpose. While Mary is often lauded for her response 
uh, to Gabriel's announcements. Here I am, a servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Mary's reply demonstrates her full trust and confidence in, in God's will, not only for her, but for the entire future of the world. Some biblical scholars speculate that Mary is the antithesis of Eve in the Genesis account of creation. While Eve disobeys God in the Garden of Eden to exalt herself, Mary obeyed God's will and became exalted, exalted as a result. And even though we Lutherans can get down on Mary at times because of the adoration that Roman Catholics give her, I think it's probably okay to call her blessed. Just don't tell my Roman Catholic husband that I said that. Okay? In Jesus' name, amen. And now we continue our worship by professing together our beliefs in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Emmanuel has come, is here, and is coming soon. Let us join in prayer for the church, the earth, and those who are in need, that all receive what God promises to give. Gracious God, all generations call you blessed. In this holy season, we pray for our neighbors of other denominations and faiths. Inspire the faith of their people. Cultivate understanding among us and strengthen us in love and service to our community. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Creator God, you scatter the proud. Everything we have belongs first to you. Bless and protect the seas, mountains, plains, forests, skies and soils that surround us. Give us humility as we tend them. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Righteous God, you humble the powerful and lift up the lowly. We pray for the leaders of all nations that they amplify the voices of people in need. Guide all people entrusted with leadership to create societies in which everyone can flourish. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Compassionate God, you fill the hungry with good things and send the rich away empty. Nourish those who lack access to adequate food and nutrition. Bless the work of advocates, community organizers, and food pantries. Encourage others to provide for their neighbors in need. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Healing God, 
you pour out mercy to all who cry out to you. Surround everyone in need of healing in body, mind, and spirit with your tender presence. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Eternal God, you are faithful to the promises you made to our forebears. We give thanks for the ministry of Katerina von Bora Luther and other ancestors who organized, planned, dreamed, encouraged, and reach out, reached out as they serve you. We give thanks for the bold leaders, leadership of female leaders in our own time. Inspire others with their steadfast witness. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O oh God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of our Lord. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. <laughs>